this is the first class of the Christ life slash the crucified life. I mean, crucified life. Because <laughs> you will be fried in this class. After I get through with you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, we're going to look at several different scriptures. Um, you can go ahead and turn to Colossians because what I want to do is for you make a bridge from the last course that we took, which was Colossians, to the one that we're on now. But for those who may later watch this by video, um, who knows what you were listening to before this. But this is for those who are present at this time. All right. So we want to talk about the Christ life. We want to talk about the crucified life. Both of those are represented by Christ. Uh, the Christ life is a reference to his life within us, that it not just be a Christian life, but it is his life within us. And then the crucified life is also a reference to that, but it more pertains not just to the person who is in us, which is Christ, but the nature by which he functions. So we're going to be, we're going to be touching on both of those, but I think it's um, uh, important that we understand sort of a difference there, that we understand that um, there is a, a portion where we'll be emphasizing uh, Christ being the life of the believer as opposed to us being what it's all about, which we cover a lot, but we're going to add to that. <clears throat> and then the other being, well, if Christ is the life within us, then we need to examine his nature and therefore the nature by which we will carry ourselves uh, in terms of our walk or in terms of how we live, that sort of thing. So, um, just the first thought is that, I mean, because dealing with just the Christ life, why would God feel the need to put his son within us? I mean, think of it like this. Jesus could have come down here, he could have died, and he could have bore our sins, and he could have taken care of all of the redemptive needs that we had, and then just gone back up and not, not be in us at all. Why? Why would God feel the need that Christ must be in us? And um, we'll have several different scriptures here uh, that we can discuss. And, and tonight I'd like a little discussion. I'd like to hear some comments um, as we go through these scriptures so that we can um, you know, get a broader view in this first class of some of the things that will be brought up later. Um, <clears throat> Colossians 1.27, <clears throat> to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So uh, the simple question is, as I said before, why would God put Christ in us? There's a bunch of answers. Hands, please. Why would God? Kelly? <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. I know, I'll repeat it for the people on Skype. Kelly said that God desires to put his son in us to because he's real nice and he wants to treat us nice by giving us the son okay you want to repeat that again he desires more of his firstborn son in sacrifice so what you just covered was the christ life and the crucified life which is fine because it's it's you know it's difficult to divide the two but when you're studying or when you're thinking through some of these things, it's good to, at first, 
just focus on the fact that, you know, Christianity says, you know, um, I mean, there, can I say it like this? There is a Christianity that doesn't need Christ in us. I'm not, I don't, I could say that a lot of different ways, but I'll, that's my nice way. Yeah. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that they, um, it's, I would, I don't think they're thinking, I don't need Christ. <clears throat> what they're thinking is that, or what they're not thinking is that they don't really understand that it's supposed to be his life within us. Therefore, the alternative to that is <clears throat> that we be good Christians, that we, we do all of the changing, that we do all of the things that God wants. And, uh, in, and doing that, that's going to be what satisfies God. Okay, so that, that, that makes sense to them. Now we know, and one of, the, one of the purposes for this particular class is that I would like for us to be able to cover a bunch of scriptures, and that's what I'm gonna to do tonight, hopefully, Lord willing. And, uh, and when I say that, what I mean is to begin to show how astounding it is that Christ in you is in the New Testament. And, uh, and then to make us think, why would God put Christ in us when he could have just saved us, redeemed us all, and then immediately left and not come back, but he also put him in us. So Deb, what was your? Okay, so Deb says she likes the, the contrast of the redemptive act where he could have left, but that God wanted <clears throat> his nature within us, which really actually, which I've said, but I'm, I'm going to keep trying to, to intertwine this. When we talk about his nature, we're talking about the crucified life. That's what we're talking about. Um, for example, I was sharing in Arkansas this past week, and uh, part of my closing thing was we, we had been talking about, and I, it's stuff we've been talking about here, about the firstborn in, in Abraham's life. And, you know, Lot, uh, he thought Lot was the firstborn, but he wasn't. And then he went to Eliezer, and <clears throat> he wasn't. And then he went to Ishmael, <laughs> you know. We're all trying to nail down Jesus, the firstborn, in a certain way. We're trying to get hold of him and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> but the point that I wanted to make in bringing this up is, and then he and Sarah had Isaac. And here he is. He's born. He's there. They go, this is the promise. This is everything God wanted. This is the one hugging the baby and all this stuff. And then... Then as he's getting a little older, walking with Abraham and playing and, and you know, doing all this stuff and the, all of the, the family life and all of the great things that that, you know, brings to mind that would be happening, uh, their joy that this is the firstborn. But that's not the firstborn, and that's, this is my ending of what I was sharing there, that Isaac is not the firstborn, and, and I'm not just talking about Jesus is the firstborn, like in Galatians 3.16. I'm talking about Isaac right there does not represent the firstborn. And so I proceeded to say it wasn't until what? Genesis 22, where there was an altar, and he became what I call an altered son. I don't mean he altered himself. I'm talking about the altar. And uh, he became an altered son, or Christ crucified. And then he represented the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from among the dead. The firstborn of, of, of all that would come forth. But that's, a, that's out of death. That's out of death that he became the firstborn in that way. So the point being that Jesus, and I, I, I likened uh, Isaac before the altar in Genesis 22, I likened him to Jesus of Nazareth. And in that place, I called him the first man. 
which usually we refer to Adam, but I referred to Jesus of Nazareth as the first man, or I referred to Isaac before he was offered on the altar as the first man, but then the new man came forth. And um, when they walked away from that altar, Abraham's relationship drastically, radically changed with his son because now he knew him as the father knew him. All right, so jumping classes here, but I'm going to do it because you got to realize there's a whole lot flowing through me right now. God help us. All right, someone else. Yes. I was, uh, I was thinking back to Genesis, God wanting others after his own kind. Mm-hmm. You know, this thing, man, all of our things in which we think, oh, this is God. Right. But, you know, because we think that was the immediate result, he made us in the I was thinking it was a process. The goal was never redemption. Redemption was the means to achieve the goal, which was something that we wanted before we had redemption. Yeah, thanks for not saying a whole bunch because I'm not going to remember all this for repeating. So, uh, <laughs> but but it was good. Jason Main was just saying that um, uh, in Genesis. In the first couple of chapters, you know, uh, in creation, when God said, let us make man in our own image, he was saying, we assume that, well, when man was made, that's the image that God wanted. But, of course, we find out in the New Testament that the image that he wanted was the image of Christ, that we be conformed. It literally says that, and it not only says that, it says that in Romans 8, and it not only says it in Romans 8, but it says... uh, uh, that, that we might be uh, uh, conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn. So there's that. You see all these, how these things all tie together when you start, start seeing it by the Holy Spirit. And so he's saying that God put Christ in us so that he would be the image that the Father wanted. And you see that in Hebrews 1, uh, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. It does. <laughs> yeah, Rob. I just think one thing that I've seen is that um, is that that nature is that which endures eternity. Because God just saving us so we can be good or whatever. People can be good for the wrong reasons. But that nature is never like that. It's always a perfect. And that's why we want this. No. Well, we'll get, we're going to get into that more, so I, I won't go too far into that. Any other comments on that? Yes. Okay, so, so Caitlin said, because he's the hope of glory and we are not. All right. So Colossians 127 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the question is, what? does glory mean in that verse? What does glory mean? Because we all know it, especially in this place. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, hope of what? Well, glory, you know. Well, what is glory? Well, I don't know, but it's, it's glorious. <laughs> so what is it? Give it a thought here, and then maybe I'll get a comment. And don't be afraid to... You know, we're always afraid because it might be a wrong answer, but there are no wrong answers, only stupid answers. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I just shut the whole place down. <laughs> yes, Lindsay. Uh, just the, all that came to mind was when Jesus, in John, I think it's in John 17, when he says, glorify and I might glorify you and he's talking about going to the cross. Amen. Um, well, anybody else? Glory. What is glory? Yeah, Jason. Uh, just the manifesting of that image in outwardly. You know, I think, uh, especially with what you just said, glorify me, that I glorify you, 
show them who we are, it's manifested in a way that they can't deny it. Like, you know, it's just like, this, is, this, is, well, this thing I've worked internally for the three, my three years in ministry, in particular, I would say this is the image of the living God. Yeah, so it's talking about manifesting that image outwardly. <clears throat> so putting those two together, Lindsay and what Jason said was, uh, I've, I've got one scripture here, John 17, 5, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self. Okay, so glory, um, it, uh, at least in my understanding, in the way that I've kind of seen it, <clears throat> yes, it is manifesting. It is um, uh, that, uh, script, those scriptures, but it is to like Jesus is saying here, I'm gl glorify me with your own self, not glorify me so that I'm a great king and everybody goes, oh, you're a great king. That's, that's human glory. But he says, glorify thou me. And I, in fact, he says, and now, <laughs> I love it, and now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So glory relates to um, the Father glorifying the Son, the Son glorifying the Father, the Holy Spirit declaring the Son, the, you know, on and on. It's that Spirit that's in the Godhead. It's that Spirit that is among the Trinity that um, their joy, their glory is that the other be glorified. Now put that in your smoke and pipe it. <laughs> There it is. Yes, Lindsay. Well, I got maybe Hebrews 1, verses 2 and 3 go with that too. Having these last days spoken unto us by his Son, who he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he gave the worlds, who being the brightness of glory and the express image of his person. Right. So she's quoting uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> And it is expressing that the Son is the glory of God, of the Father, and, and the express image of it. I've always liked that word, express image. I see in it the expressed image, and that's what you were saying, an expressed image, a manifested image. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I also find it interesting that maybe... The last two verses in chapter 1 of Colossians might also add and build around what we've been saying here. So let's read from verse 27 again all the way through. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach. Okay, so Paul is functioning in glory, whom we preach. He's not declaring himself. We, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and our, ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. So it's that same spirit, you see. And this is a, I, I just want to say this in light of what I just said. This is going to be an important part of, of this particular class is that, um, I, in fact, I may even give you some homework since you're going to have two weeks before I, so that you do what we just did where we found that Paul is, is doing the glory thing of verse 27, though that was relating, you know, wider, but he's doing it where he's not declaring himself, he's giving Jesus the glory. Um, or, um, and I'm using that as an example, but probably I will have you um, look up particularly scriptures that are not directly, this in the New Testament, not directly um, saying Christ in you or saying Christ crucified at work in you. Won't even mention his name. But where you can look and go, you know what? That's got to be Christ in you. That's got to be there. Because that's just like Jesus. Do you kind of understand what I'm saying? Anybody need a clarification on, on that? Um, let's see. Um, uh, well, I've spent... 
Yeah, well, I can give this example. I spent my whole life giving examples in this. <laughs> Go listen to any number of my class. No, don't do that. That's like Googling the answer. Get in the scripture. and But basically, it would be like uh, Paul, uh, let's just use his, him as an example. Paul, uh, when he could have exalted himself, he doesn't. And then he lifts up somebody else. That would be glory that would be that's not us that's not paul that's not paul look at him before he met jesus he was rank he was working his way up the ladder that's what he said his his description in galatians 1 and it was all to be something greater and higher and when he met the lord and not just salvation but you know spent time out in the wilderness and and damascus seeking the lord he came back with what he described as a revelation of Christ, an unveiling of Christ. And he doesn't refer that to the road to Emmaus. He refers that to the word. And he saw Christ, but he saw him, Christ in him. And he says, that's when he starts talking about whom he preached. And that's where, in all those verses where he's talking about that, chapter 2, before he's done, he's talking about, I am crucified with Christ. All right, well, even that statement. You don't say, I am crucified with Christ if, and make it real. You can, anybody can parrot it. You don't say that and make it real unless it's Christ in you. Because you don't want to be crucified with Christ. I, I came up with a phrase and I put it in my thing and we were discussing it. Death is the new pretty. Come on, come on, people. Give me a little bit of credit here. <laughs> We're talking about in God's eyes. All right, so there are so many places. There are so many places. I mean, if you just want, if you want a couple of books that are full of it, where it's just Paul constantly telling you, try First and Second Corinthians. He's making all these statements of what, uh, hmm, how about this one? Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a book of the Bible that's just full of the seed of Christ and him coming forth. It's the book of Philippians. I'm sorry, Philippians. Did I say it wrong? <laughs> I, I do I do love some of you people like Carol sitting back there she is rocking just going but the look on her face is that's Randy <laughs> there he is if you want to know him there he is he is full of the seed it's coming forth Philippians okay so here's okay this is bad that I'm going to even do this for you in chapter two of Philippians he is really spelling out Christ in his nature, the crucified life. He's really spelling it out. Guess what? Chapter 3 is he's living it. And that's where you can use it without him, him saying, this is Christ in me. You just look at it and you go, that's Christ in me. <laughs> so anyway, try that homework. You got two weeks, three weeks. By the time we get back. Okay, so it should give you time to at least get like 10 scriptures. Come on. You got a whole Bible. <laughs> All right. So, so I didn't get very far in this, did I? Whom we preach. Whom we preach. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Wherefore, I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. And that is a, he's, he's saying, a, you could say it like this. Paul is saying a doctrinal statement in verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I don't believe he is. And I don't believe most of the time when we look at the scriptures, we think that, that Paul or whoever's writing it, Peter or any of those guys, are, are teaching us doctrine. They're not. This is his reality. This is the Jesus he met. He met 
Christ, not just on the road to Damascus. Yes, that's when he got saved. Thank God for it. But that is not the end of it. And he realizes that and goes out and pursues the Lord on his own instead of going to Jerusalem. Why do I keep quoting Galatians all the time? <laughs> that's what he did. Going to Jerusalem instead of looking up the, the apostles that, you know, that were before him. He goes out, takes the word with him. And God begins to reveal Christ in him. So, and then he says at the end of that first chapter, and they glorified God in me. There's that. There it is. There it is. There's the glory again. They glorified God. In, he didn't say they glorified what God did to me. That's us. That's so Christian. And, I, and I'm, you know. You, but you do realize that the word Christian is only used two or three times in the whole New Testament. That's good. But it talks about Christ in you over and over and over a million times, you know. So, um, so here, wherefore I also labor, striving according to his work. So he's saying this is his working that worketh in me mightily. I mean, the guy has jumped full fledged in, you know what I mean? I mean, he didn't walk up to the, to the pond and go, oh, it's cold. You know, and just back off and, you know, and it, I'll go oh, and get a little foot in there. And he went, no, I'm getting in. And he went and dove in. Yeah. Woo, this is cold. And now it's not. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Instead of a week later going, oh, I got my leg in now. <laughs> you know, or 10 years later. Anyway. Wherefore, I also labor. This is. This is my labor. What, how, teach us how you labor uh, according to his working. This is how I'm working, not at all. I'm at rest. He's fulfilling the heart and the satisfaction of the Father. And then he says, he doesn't say, which worketh in me on Sunday. You know, it worketh in me in the prayer meetings. You know. Anyway, but there is a mighty working. All right, so, so there are zealous people and a zealous Christian compared to a non-zealous Christian would look like he is really going for God, right? Anybody here ever seen a zealous Christian? Yeah. Um, but he could be totally deceived, and I don't mean this in a negative way, and I'm not, trying, uh, yeah, I'm not saying he's going to hell or anything like that. I'm just trying to look at the word of God and go with what it's saying. He could be deceived, or he could be full of himself, or he could be totally off from, from anything that the Lord wanted, and he's working you know, zealously to bring something about, but God's going, well, I didn't really want that. In fact, if, well, I'm not going to go there yet, but, um, but here Paul is saying, you know, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, and, and then within two verses he's saying, this is not doctrine, this is not a teaching, this is not, you know, that we're supposed to, the Jesus that we know is supposed to be a doctrine of Christ in us. No, no, no. The Jesus that we know is the Jesus that Paul knew. And he's the same Jesus, and he's the same in us, and he'll be mighty in us. But, you know, there has to be him and not me. There has to be that. Or we're going, well, I'm really growing in this doctrine. You know, I've got the terminology down. I'm feeling good now. I felt really weird when I didn't. Now that I got the terminology, I got everything, you know. No. I mean, I think it's good to get the terminology because it can help you get to the truth because you're going, okay, now I want to see behind the veil of this terminology. You stick your face in the Holy of Holies and see him, it'll do something to you. you know, it, it'll change your doctrine. <laughs> He'll become your doctrine, you know, and you'll be going, whoa, 
Some of you go, whoa, that's too much. No, 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 you're too much. You must decrease. All right, so um, let's look at the word temple. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3.16. Ready? 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Okay? So, um, you know, when I ask why is Christ in you, I, Kelly's hand went up first and I called upon her. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to remind me not to call on her first. <laughs> Let some other people say some stuff because here we have the, why, why would we be called a temple? Why couldn't we just be called Christians with Jesus in us? Okay, I'm trying to make you think, you know. Why? Why not just be, I, I'm a Christian, I got Jesus in me. Why would you be called a temple? Well, there's only one reason for the temple, and that was sacrifice. And that was to be that, well, we'll get into that verse too, I guess. Maybe not today. But it was a place of sacrifice. It was a place where you gave God what he wanted. God said, you know, out of all the things, God could have said, you know what? I made the planet, but I really dig the gold. Would y'all just dig up all the gold and bring it to me? He could have, you know. <laughs> and, and I would have said, just make a bunch, you know. <laughs> you know just do it right here. Poof. You know. Anyway. Um, that's why he looks at me the way he does. <laughs> so the temple, that's the place. That's where it all happens. And the Lord from the very beginning said, Give me sacrifice, give me this. This is the 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 picture, of course, is what? It's a picture of Christ and him crucified. So that Old Testament temple is a shadow and they're offering all these lambs and all this stuff and all this this sweet incense or sweet savor actually is going up to God and 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 they're going well I don't get it I guess he likes you know burnt toast or something you know what I mean? <laughs> burnt sacrifice you know but it but it's a sweet savor and so you know maybe they just went well I don't know what the deal is with God but this is what he wants Okay, well, that's a good start. Wouldn't you say that? Yeah. That's a good start. I, don't, I may not understand this, but I want to give him what he wants. Yeah. But eventually, the New Testament came along, and they began to see not just one example on the cross, but he wanted us to be a temple. He didn't just want to die. He didn't, see, he didn't even die in the temple. He died outside the camp. But he wants to be given in the temple. So he decided to make us his, the real temple. The real temple. Amen. So, yeah, Dennis? Isn't that, isn't that where ultimately he meets us? Yeah, that's exactly right. Then there's so many parts to this, but I'm glad you didn't go somewhere else because I had another thing. But... What Dennis said was that, isn't that where he ultimately meets with us? And that's what he did say. That was his heart. And, you know, and again, I mean, let's, let's take it out over here. Again, he could have said, you know what? There's, a, there's this oak tree in the wilderness. It's the only one. It'll be easy to find. I want to meet there under there because it's real shady and the breeze is nice there and all this kind of stuff. That's the way we think. We, you know, we think, well, let's meet at a, you know, when you ask to meet with somebody, do you say, hey, let's go to the garbage dump? <laughs> no, you don't do that. Well, in a sense, he's going to the garbage dump. It's called us. But he wants to meet with us there in that. But see, he said, I would, I would meet you there. And, of course, he's in the Holy of Holies. But you can't get to the Holy of Holies. You have to walk through the first door of the temple 
and there's a big altar. You go, you go hey, y'all put this in the way. It's kind of hard to get around it, you know. And he's going, you know, don't come try to enter in another way. You know, this is it. I am crucified with Christ. I mean, folks, there can be a lot of teaching. We can do it in this place. There can be a lot of teaching about uh, God graciously saving us and God graciously, um, um, you know, redeeming me from this and that, from my sins and from hell and doing all this stuff. And I, I still believe in all of that. I, I do. But you eventually move past the altar in that sense and start moving into the laver, which represents the washing of the water of the word. You do that after the altar because that's when you're going to understand the altar. So, And then there's a process until it's the real God in there, no longer shadows. And, you know, the, the one that God wants out of us requires our death with Christ. There has to be a death. There has to be a death. That's what that altar is. It's the first thing. There has to be a death. And we have to be crucified with Christ. We have to, you know, we have to understand that to such a degree that we can say with Paul, it's not I, it's Christ. Anybody can say that doctrinally. Anybody can say that. Okay. Well, doctrinally, you know, it's not I but Christ, and I believe the doctrine of it, and therefore it's not I but Christ, but I tend to act like totally the opposite of Christ. In fact, sometimes I'm sort of anti-Christ the way I act, but it's not me, it's Christ. Anybody get what I'm saying here? <laughs> that it's, my God, the Father's not going, yeah, oh, good, they're just playing with this. I love that. No, he wants his son. You know, and he's not, he's not enjoying our little uh, religious parade that goes, you know, that, that takes these things. It's almost like a, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a, and maybe you were, I guess Kath, you know, Kelly was Catholic or whatever, but um, uh, we were down in, you know, I think it might have been Guatemala many, many, many years ago, way before Nisi and Jason were there, and <clears throat> we had set up a, a, a thing outside right in the big square there, and we were preaching Christ all night long. We had different ones getting up and sharing. Big crowds gathering around. And after a little while, this big parade started, and it was the Catholics, and they were holding up all their objects and doing all this stuff. And they were intentionally there while we were there to shut us down. They were playing so loud that you couldn't hardly even hear us. And just intentionally trying to take away from Christ crucified. Because what we're holding up here, Jesus and Mary and all this, this is, this is what's important. I mean, I was there, okay, so I want you to try to be there with me while I'm telling you this. They're holding up these objects or carrying with bunches of people, you know. They had four guys on poles with this big old statue of Mary, you know. At least in the old covenant, they had the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And this thing is not alive. And they're going, we need to stop those guys preaching the life of it. We need to shut it down so nobody will hear that Jesus is really life in us. And I don't know if they're thinking, well, we're not living it, but, you know, we don't want them to think we're supposed to. I'm sure they're not thinking that. And I'm sure, there's, I'm sure there is sincerity in there. I, I believe that. I believe there was sincerity of going, this is, you know, we've got it. You know, we, this is, you know, this has been around, you know, you know, since whatever. Well, Jesus has been around from before there was anything, and he wants to live in us. He wants to live in us, but that requires a death. And so any religion 
that is going to void out the death is going to void out Christ. And and see, I always wa I walk on eggshells with this because I am not trying to get us, you know, what is it, militant, looking around or judging or whatever. I'm not. That's not in my mind. I'm just saying. Can we separate our hearts unto the Lord in this way if it's in the Word of God? That's all. That's, that's all I'm saying, you know. I believe many of people in de denominations and everything are truly saved and are fine on that front because salvation is a free gift. Did you know that? But if you're going to know Jesus, Paul said it's going to cost you. <laughs> that's after salvation. Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. <laughs> That's what he says. That's what he says. Yeah, so you guys are getting to see why people call us those names. It's my fault. <laughs> it's me. I admit it. All right, so let me, sh let me shoot another one at you. Uh, it's uh, 1 Corinthians 6.15. It also talks about the temple. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 6.15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? God forbid. Okay, so we go, you know, <clears throat> all we see in that is, um, oh, what are you saying? <laughs> you know, is that me? Whatever. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I believe with all my heart that the Lord wants us. <laughs> he wants us joined to him because this is a joining type thing here. He wants us joined to him. I mean, it's talking, the, the contrast is a harlot compared to what he wants. A bride, a wife, a, a, a one after his own kind. Anybody get that? I mean, that's really what's motivating. I, I don't think God's just going up there and going, uh, you know, I think I'll just make some random things. Uh, you got to wash your hands after every meal. Because that was in the Old Testament. <laughs> just, you just got to do it. I just, it just came to me. Yeah, well, no, I'm for that one. <laughs> but I'm just trying to use this one as an example, you know, so washy, washy, washy. What do you think? And the father goes, you know, no, <laughs> no. There's, there's deeper things at work in his heart. And he's wanting that which is his to be unto him joined. And I thought when, you know, when I looked at these scriptures one time, you know, a long time ago, I looked at it and I went, huh, he could have said, you know, um, he could have used any other word, but he's using like a harlot because he's, he's looking at um, this in a relational way, an intimate relational way. Can I say it like that? And it, he's, that's, he's using that kind of language, intimate relational way. And he's saying... Behind it all, I really want you to be with me. And I want to dwell in you, because he starts it with you're, you're, you're his temple, but you're, we're also his body, because your body is the temple. No, you're not. Your bodies are the temple. So I don't know if you can see what I'm saying there, but I just see God expressing something greater than just do's and don'ts, you know, like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, this is good and this is evil. I see behind it a heart that desires us in union with him by Christ, oneness with his son that brings us into the heart of God. So, all right, what do we got? Okay, how about... Um, Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, 7. You know what? I'm running out of time here. Let me make sure. Uh, let's, let's, let's do this one. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. 
But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. All right. That scripture, that, that verse, that one verse, now all around it, it, you know, he says, you know, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Christ's sake. But in this verse, just if you look at this verse, it doesn't say Christ in you. But it is, because that's the context, right? But what it does say is it refers to him not as the Son of God. It refers to him not as um, our Savior. It doesn't refer to him as, you know, our, our source of guidance. I mean, to me, it's sobering, these things. Even the last one that I was mentioning and having a hard time fully expressing it, it's sobering to me because I see something in the heart of the Father and the heart of God to, toward his Son that is, um, and toward us being his, the body of his Son, not the body of us, if you will. Um, and he says, we have this treasure. Now we say, well, Paul wrote that. Well, okay. All scripture is inspired by God. And, um, and, if, and if we're going to say that, well, Paul, but Paul wrote that, then we're not going to call it the word of God. Don't call it the word of God then. Am I right or wrong? You know, well, it's the word of Paul and and we have the word of James and you know, all this stuff. No, it's the word of God. And if I take it that way, then I see the father referring to his son within us as a treasure. He would treasure if he could get his son out of us. That he would consider it a treasure. That he would go, you know, that he... It, 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 be calling it a treasure in us is so much higher than saying, you know, I'm really glad you're saved. <laughs> you know, I'm really glad you're saved. Or I'm really glad you went on that mission trip. You know. <laughs> what are they doing? No, no. He's got this heart, this thing that this and and I know that he's referring to Jesus as the treasure, but he's not just doing that. He's calling, he's calling it in earth and vessels, and he's seeing a combination there of him in us. And he says, "This is this is what I want. This is like treasure to me." All right. So if we start looking closer at some of these verses, and we start. Say, and not just going, okay, you know, Holy Spirit, teach me the truths of the Word of God. But we start saying, you know, may these verses like light up the heart of God to me so that when I, so that when I see that he wants this treasure in me that is Christ and he, he treasures that union, I will go... I want that for you. That's glory, isn't it? That's glory because you want. I want that for you, not for myself. Then it's not glory; it's self promotion. So we start seeing those, and then we see we see why he's talking about a harlot that's opposed to being joined to him, and you're supposed to be in the temple, not outside of the temple, as it were, if you understand with relations out there but and and you see that usage of of the word harlot and you go this is offensive to you am i crazy it's like this is this is offensive to you not because we're sinning but because 
we're violating your heart. We don't even see your heart. We're just doing it and, you know, we wouldn't go, well, I guess I'm being a harlot right now. <laughs> we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't say that. We don't, we don't go there. We just go, well, I sinned or I messed up. That's us. And he goes, this, this wounds me greater than that. I wanted my son in you, and this is not my son in you. Or, you know, I, want, I wanted to see this union where I placed my treasure, my treasure. So these, it's these kind of things that the Holy Spirit is really, really, really constantly dealing with me on. He is, it is, it's not written in the scripture like that. It's not like, okay, pay attention. This is going to be about God's heart and you violate it. Not like, it's like when he comes to the things of his heart, it's sort of veiled because he's not going to declare himself. You know what I mean? He's going to be faithful to us no matter what. He's going to, you know. But I don't want to live that way. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to live in a way that doesn't, doesn't notice things, that doesn't notice things of his heart, that doesn't, that just calls it, um, I mean, Christ in you, the hope of glory, or Christ in you. Well, it's just, you know, Father, I just want what you mean by Christ in you. you. I want that. He's going, you mean my treasure in you and that I would treasure that union? Is that what you're talking about? You, is that what you want? No, not really. I just want the doctrinal fulfillment of this within me. Just do, just do the thing so I can fit in at new creation. <laughs> then let's shut it down. You know what I mean? That's how I feel. Then let's shut it down. If, it, if we can't, move past just the doctrinal phase of all of the understanding and there is that where you have to study and you have to seek and you begin to see but but it's like a snowball going downhill it should start gathering momentum and gathering as it goes and gets bigger and stronger and not just stay in a little snowball that hits a little twig and goes oh and stops you know well i went further than you know the baptist you know, and God's going, yeah, you went further. No, the Baptists may have more, you, you know what I mean? They may have more than you do at this stage because it may be real to a bunch of them. I'm just saying, you know, we don't know. And that's why we, that's also why we can't judge denominations on that front. We can see in a general way that maybe they don't embrace Christ in you. But maybe their salvation is more real than ours, even though we're saved. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that could be. So we just say, if you're born again, we love you. We're all in the family. Um, come seek the Lord with us if you want to. But we want to, and we're going to pursue him. This is our heart. And we're not trying to look better or, you know, more superior because Christ in you automatically demands that you're you're not superior. It says he is. Right? Or or we're or we're preaching it wrong. If right? I mean then we then something went wrong with us if we ended up something great out of this when it's all supposed to be about him then something has gone wrong and we have to re-examine ourselves and our our view of these things anyway still having fun <laughs> amen let's pray father we do love you and we do want to know your heart in these things we don't just want to grasp a a a truth we want to grasp the reality as it came out of your heart, as it is in your heart. And we believe that your greatest desire, greater than just saving us, as, as Father Jason shared tonight, 
Yes, that was important, and it's on the way, but it, it's not the thing that you were after from the beginning. To truly get your son in these vessels. To truly have a union with you as a temple for your life, and for your ways, and for your heart, and to, for your sacrificial nature. So we ask you to continue, to continue to um, breathe the word of God to us, not just that we be taught the words of God, but for you to breathe the word of God into us. And may we breathe in your breath of life, your breath of life, your, your very breathing breath of life into us. So we thank you. We thank you. And we want to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We've got another class coming up.